Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. Today, equipment autopsy of a PV Mark II series MC12 stereo mixing system, which is a $5 name for a ratty old 80s mixing console. We got 12 inputs, two sub channels, and a stereo main out. This is gonna be cool because I like taking apart mixing consoles, they're pretty nifty. And this is a big old 80s one, so there's like lots of stuff and it's just gonna be cool. I think this is individual card design, so we'll get to look at the individual cards and talk about all that. Now before we get into this, let's talk about what a mixing console is. This is the big sexy desk that you see with all the knobs that makes everybody want to become a producer because they think that it's the producer's job to turn all the knobs. It actually isn't. Usually there's, there's an engineer whose job it is to twiddle the knobs. What this does is it works a lot like your stereo. You've got sound sources that feed sounds in and it could be a microphone or, or a guitar or, or a CD player or whatever you want. And those come in. Now these are all the input channels here. You've got 12 on this board, 12 inputs. And then this routes those out to this channel here, which is our outputs. This is our main out. So this is your big volume knob out. So these are all volume knobs in. This is your volume knob out. All of these feed down to these. There's two other outs that you can use for when you see the guy in the recording studio and he's got headphones on and he can hear himself singing and stuff like that. That's what you use these for. These are sending out for monitor sends and things like that. It gets really complicated. There's a lot to it, but it breaks down to very simple component parts. All of these knobs you can ignore except for one track. We'll just, we'll just pick track eight right here because you'll notice the knobs are all the same on all the inputs. So we'll talk just about one of them and this knob does the exact same things as all the other ones in its row up here. So this is, it's labeled here, attention. That's actually attenuation. And this is your gain, your volume input. And the idea is you want these all to be at about the same level of loudness so you take your level at the bottom, this is your output level. This is a volume knob too, just like this is. But you bring this one up to about here, about 75%. These are labeled weird. It goes from infinity to minus 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, five, and zero. Um, so in theory, zero would be just unity gain, and this is a totally passive thing. But when I'm setting them up, I bring it down to about 75%, which is where unity gain is on most consoles. Usually it's marked. Um, and then you set your main outputs to the same level. We'll use 10 on this console. And then you would feed a signal in here. You'd have the person just sing or play the guitar or whatever. And you adjust this knob to set the level over here on your output to, well, zero here. This, this one actually has negative and positive. So you'd adjust this to where that's at zero and that's your unity gain, where you're not attenuating the signal and you're not amplifying the signal. You want it, and it's gonna bounce around a little bit, but you want them right around zero. And you do that on each channel. You go through one at a time, you turn off all the other channels, you bring in just that one, and you twiddle it to get them to just about zero. And that's called setting your levels. This is the first thing that most people do when they start actually setting up a sound console. If you keep seeing me turning all these to zero, that's just habit, I'm sorry. It just, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time sitting in front of one of these. Now, your next one here is the monitor send. And I'm not familiar with this console, but that probably sends off to one of these here. Um, or this could go off to a separate monitor mix that just might be hardwired. Then this section here, these four knobs, work as an equalizer. This is what's called a parametric equalizer. And it's on your stereo where you've got like the knob for bass and maybe you have one for mid-range and then one for treble, one for high. This is the same thing. This does your high frequencies and it's just labeled high. It doesn't give us a frequency range. It doesn't tell us anything about it. It's just high. Well, high. Um, this is mid two, which is your upper mid range. This is mid one, which is your lower mid range. And this is your low frequency sound. So if you're recording like a guy who's singing with a handheld mic, and there's a lot of handling noise because he's holding the microphone. You can bring the low down a bit and get rid of the rumble. Um, this is a lot better on Mackie mixing consoles because they have like low cut filters and stuff like that. I prefer Mackies, that's just me. And then down here you have an effect send. 
So this is if you had like reverb on the guy's voice. This is how much you're sending off to the effects end. And then over here you've got effects returns and things like that. And you can control how much coming in. The bottom knob here is pan. This is balance. It comes from the film world of panorama, which is to, to pan the camera from left to right. This does the same thing. If these are all stereo channels, um, so, or these might not be, these might be mono channels. But if you have the singer here and you want the singer to just appear in the left ear, you pan this to A, not left and right, A and B, because eh. Um, so you just pan that hard to A and now everything's gonna come in on the left ear and you'll only hear that on the left output channel. If you put it in the middle, you'll hear it in the middle balance between both ears. And if you put it on B for right, you'll hear it on the right ear. So there's a lot that you can do. You've got a lot of knobs here and it looks terrifying when you see them all together, but it's really not that big a deal. And better mixing consoles have more knobs and more buttons and you can do a lot more. You can, you can do all kinds of routing. This is a really simple garage band live console. This is designed for probably about a four piece band, maybe a five piece band and just a group of guys playing bars, doing really simple stuff where you just need to feed out to the big amplifiers and maybe a couple monitor mixes and, and really nothing, nothing complicated at all. So in the real world, it, it looks like there's a lot with 12 channels here, but watch how fast they go. So you've got your guy singing and then you've got your bass player. He might even have two. Uh, modern day bass stuff will usually feed into the console and stereo because he's gonna have that really cool wah-wah and maybe some reverb. You're gonna have your keyboard player. You're gonna have your drummer. Now, he might have one microphone if he's broke. If he's a really good drummer, he might only have two microphones. And if he does, they'll be really good microphones and they'll sit right here over his head in an XY pair. So he might be a really good drummer. He's probably not. So he's probably gonna have bass drum and snare drum and maybe one for the hi-hat and maybe an overhead or two. Okay, drums use a lot of mics in a hurry. And then you gotta have your guitar player. He's gonna want to, and now we're out of 12 channels and we're just getting started. Because you might need three more for your backing vocals, okay? Because you, you, gotta, you gotta have the, the ooh-ah girls in the background. And you might need two more for that crappy drum machine that always makes the buzzy, high frequency, icky sound, you know, because you've gotta have that classic 808 snare. And, and they go really fast. And then you need one for the triangle, because you just have to. So they, they add up fast, and it's normal to see mixing consoles. The small end, you might have eight, but 12 is kind of common. Usually they go from eight to 16. And then if you're doing serious stuff, 24 and 32 are both really common and easy to get. It's really easy to get a 32 channel console. Um, if I was doing this kind of stuff because I'm me, I'd do it on a 16 VLZ, uh, or a 1602, and I'd have 16 inputs and it would be in a smaller space because convenient. So that's what we've got. This is all of our input. This is all of our output. And I think as I take this apart, I should have a big board back here with all the inputs and outputs. And then there'll be a lot of wires or stuff. It's 80s, so there could be a lot of wires. It could be all circuit boards, we don't know. And then down here, we're gonna have a whole lot of vertical cards and each card will have all the stuff for one input channel. And then over here, these will be separate cards with the output channel. And buried somewhere in here, probably in this area, will be the big power supply. That's what I think. I called it. And now let's start digging in and we'll just start taking out chassis screws and stuff. There's nothing on the sides. So I'm just gonna start taking off the top and see what we see. I used to have that really nifty electric thing. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, it might work. It might be charged. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think this might even work today. I tried to use this the other day and it hadn't been charged. Because these are like 30 year old screws. And this thing's been... Consoles like this have a very different life than consoles in the studio.
You play with a nice Nave or an SSL console that somebody paid half a million dollars for in a recording studio, it'll never, ever be within a mile of cigarette smoke. Nobody will be allowed to drink near it, anything like that. But this console, this console has got 30 years of getting beer spilled in it and the dude sitting here smoking a cigarette who's not only breathing in the console, but he's ashing on it as well. And it's just, it's hell. It's hell being this console. It's had a hard life. It's amazing to see when this old, and it probably still works, which is a scary thing. So we got those off. Let's look around the back. I got a couple here. worked with a console that was actually made of wood in a long time. Um, do we have anything on the bottom? Yes, of course we do. Okay. And we have two different kinds of screws. I don't know what that screw did, but it came out in very interesting ways. And now screw you, you're staying, okay. Got no idea on that one. All right, I think that's everything I can easily get out. I gotta do these, because this holds the front lip on. Yeah, that's our bottom board right there. Zip screws. The console's built with zip screws. Oh, it's a reverb unit. So this didn't have an effect send to reverb. It actually has a built-in old school spring reverb unit in it. And that's gonna be fun to talk about. Ah, oh, there's parts coming off. Already, just like that. We've got, we've got big wooden frame moving around. Oh, there's a thing hooked to it. We don't need that thing. There's a little resistor mounted to the side. We don't need that. We don't need this. All right, now we're getting somewhere. This smells bad. Well, I was hoping when we flipped it over, we would find like nice individual cards and it would come out on a proper backplane. It won't. What we're going to find instead is a really cheap, crufty design, which is exactly what I would expect from PV. It's not a Behringer, so you know, it could be worse. But we're actually gonna take this apart from the back. We're gonna have to cut some stuff off here to get a look at that, so give me a moment. We're just gonna get rid of some of these plugs. On the bottom, put it right here, we have power supply. This is our step down transformer, some filter caps. We don't see a date of manufacture on anything, but it, it looks 80s. So we've got that. That's nothing special. That's, that's nothing to get excited about. But this is, this is cool. 
I'm gonna see if I can get it off here. Because this is gonna be one of the coolest parts of the whole thing. It's gonna take me a little mojo to get it off. That's our input, that's our output. This is one of those little hidden treasures. You'll find these every now and then. They're pretty common in guitar combo practice amps. And you'll find them in uh, old organs. You'll find them every now and then. This is a mechanical reverb. And it's really cool. Okay, we'll just set this down here because we're not gonna need it. All right, let's take a look at this. And you'll notice the whole thing jiggles, okay? Now, what this is, is when the box is still, this is isolated from vibrations. Now we've got our input on this side and our output on this side, and they're labeled. And it's just a RCA audio cable, okay? So the way it works is you put an input here and this end is a little speaker. And it's totally isolated from the rest of the frame. You can see this whole centerpiece just, just it's, it's all vibration isolated. It floats on springs. So this end, we apply the sound to it. it, goes through a little transformer and it moves a little magnet and it acts like a speaker. This end has the exact same setup, it works as a microphone, and for the sound to get from there to here, it has to go through these springs, and this gives it a really distinctive reverb sound. It makes it sound like you're in a big room. Um, we're gonna play with this in an upcoming video and talk about the details of how it works, but basically it's, a, a speaker and a microphone transmitting sound via a pair of big long springs and if you actually put sound through this and flick these with your finger or if you smack the side of the case you can hear that it's it's really cool stuff so this is this is an upcoming video where we're going to get into that in detail because that's that's a whole video just on its own now we're down in here and we can tell you that this came originally from a place called system one in Pile up Washington, and then there's some information here, but that gives us an idea of this thing's history, where it came from. Now this is our bus connections, so we're gonna take these all off. It's funny because I bought my first 16 track mixing console at Rainbow Music. And hi to all the cool guys at Rainbow Music. So that is their concept of a backplane for PV. I'm sure some Geek Group member will have a nifty art project for that. And now we do have individual cards, but they don't drop down and plug into a backplane. They actually hang from the front of the console and the faders are just plugged in with Molex plugs. So I'm not gonna take the whole thing apart because that's kind of redundant. We're gonna take apart a couple cards here and show you the details with them. And we'll take a look at some of the circuitry. It's pretty cool, it's all solid state, but it's a very small step up from point to point wiring. This today would be done with a whole lot of surface mount technology and it'd be very automated in its construction methods. This has a lot of manual construction. I mean, it, it took a lot of work to build this console. 
we're gonna cut the cord off it so that I can spin it around and give you guys a look inside here. You can see on the back, now this is cool because we can salvage all these. These are panel mount XLR jacks and they've got some resistors wired in them. And there is a lot of stuff on here, but to take all this off, I would need, we need a special tool that I don't have. I need a big nut driver for that. Pull that off. And we're gonna flip this over and we're gonna try and get some of these off for you guys. And that's gonna take a minute. So we're gonna do some movie magic. But this is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to uh, get a screwdriver and pop these knobs off. We're gonna save all the knobs because these are very useful and the center posts are of a standard size. So these knobs, you, if you pay attention in the future, you'll probably see some of these knobs being used in other Geek Group projects. That is very likely. And they'll go to editor down in the electronics lab and he'll find homes for them. But to take it apart, what you have to do is turn this, the outer ring, which is done best with a properly sized nut driver, but in a pinch with a pair of needle nose. When you do this, do it with one hand. Get it set up with both hands. But when you actually turn it, get one hand out of there because these at some point are going to snap together really hard and that is the blood blister manufacturing facility right in there. So that's a good way to keep from hurting yourself. Ah, and now we screw. And now they're all out. Well, that's kind of cool. Now we got a whole lot of parts in a hurry. So, most of these are the same. This is our, our channel input. It's a... Uh, it's labeled on the bottom here, you can see it, MC Series Preamp. And I think that's the date, 7 of 77, which is probably when this was designed. I don't know if that's when this board was built, but I think that's when this revision of the circuit board was designed. Um, it's certainly consistent with its manufacturing. And it's labeled HDPU. So if you want the super secret sauce and how to build your own mixing console, you can just screen cap that there. There's your layout. And this is big enough and simple enough that it would be trivial for you to make one of these at home with current technology. Now here's the, the actual circuit side here, or the, uh, the component side here. And we've got the chips on here. Are, they're a Texas Instruments chip labeled AB. And the second line is RC4558P as in Paul. 
and they're made in Malaysia. This is probably some kind of little uh, amplifier or something like that, like an op amp or something, I'm not sure. And then really simple stuff, some basic capacitors, resistors. I see a couple Zener diodes down here. Those are Zener diodes. There's some more here. Um, nothing special. This looks to be a little fuse here. But really simple. And then all of these are rotary potentiometers. And you can see that most of them have three outputs. You can see the three outputs from the rotary pots. So you'll have the wiper in the middle and then the two ends. And these are probably just carbon film potentiometers. And at this age, they've probably got a whole lot of noise in them. Um, they may be different values by different colors of the knobs. So we've got those. Here's a smaller board. And we've got more very simple componentry. You can see the circuit side here. This is the MC main board. We don't have a year on it. Oh, yeah, there we do. 7 of 77. So there's your circuit side. There's your component side. But see, once, once you get into it, now we've looked at, I, I want you to compare. We did a video where we took apart our big Wheatstone console. Now that's a very similar vintage, but that's a very high-end, professional, broadcast quality console. This is garage band PV garbage. And the difference in build technology and the build quality is very, very obvious if you compare the two videos and look at one and then look at the other. This is designed to hit a, pr there's, there's like crap floating out of here. This is designed to hit a price point. This is designed to be a knock around cheap, beat on it, it'll take a lot of abuse, but it doesn't sound all that good console. That's the point of this. This is designed to be tossed in the back of Mike's van at the end of the show every night and survive that for years. Where the Wheatstone is designed to sit in a pristine studio environment, it never moves, it does exactly one job, it's designed to be fixed. This is not designed to be repaired. If Look at all the work we had to do just to get down to getting one card out. This is not designed to be fixable. The big Wheatstone is, and that shows a lot in, in how it's built. Another cool thing in here, because the big thing of mixing consoles is potentiometers, is, is the knobs and the faders. So what I want to do is get rid of some of this mess, and we're going to dig down, and I want to open up a fader, because it's kind of cool how faders work, and I think that'd be neat to talk about. So I'm going to rip all this out. We'll set this out of the way. Now, I took out a fader from each end. I'm pretty sure they're exactly the same. They look like it, so we'll just open one up. Now, our fader has three wires out, and you can actually get four. Cut that off. We'll cut this down, because we'll leave a little flag just to show us where the wire's hooked up. And I'm going to bend these pins back on, on the back here. I'm gonna need these. See if I can get under there and pry those over. It's pretty common in a lot of electronics components that things are held together 
by having the metal housing have little tabs that fold over the back and lock, and you can see these little tabs that fold over the back and lock. Now I'm gonna take the back off, and now how this works is really, really simple. How they actually accomplish that is a step away from art and black magic, but here's, here's what we've got. We've got three main components. We've got the front panel here, and this is just a lubricated slidey bit, okay? And this little carrier, the little, the little trolley here, rides back and forth, pushing against this. You can see there's some springs on the bottom. And the springs push against a plastic pad, which is Teflon or UHMW. And that slides against this. That side controls how it feels. You want it to be a little gummy, like it's filled with peanut butter. You don't want, some faders just, you can flick them from one end to the other and they're, just, and they're really easy to move. I, don't, I, I want my fader to have a little bit of resistance to it. On the other side, you've got another set of fingers and you've got one finger here and then two little fingers here. And these fingers connect through one single piece of metal, which is usually uh, a phosphor bronze or some kind of, because copper, just straight copper is really soft and malleable. Um, so they'll use like a copper end something or a phosphor bronze because it needs to conduct electricity really well, but it needs to be strong and springy because this has to be pushed against something and stay pushed against that under spring tension for 20, 30 years, you never know. Now these little fingers ride against these tracks. Now on one side, we've just got a metal track and on the other side, we've got a carbon track, and this is a carbon resistor. There's a known resistance from this end to this end. Let's say it's, um, I don't know, from end to end it might be 100,000 ohms. This connects, so there's one wire that goes here, there's one wire that goes to this end of the track at the other end of our, our big 100,000 ohm resistor, and this is just a metal track with pretty much no resistance from end to end. So what we do is we put this where we've got, you can see our three fingers there, and this rolls over like this, and the one big one rides against this track, and the two little ones ride against these two tracks. Now this might also, I don't think it is, I think that's straight mono. Yep. Yeah, that's a single conductor, because you can see there's, there's the one electrical conductor here, and then there's the one electrical conductor here. And on the back, that's one wire there and one wire here. Sometimes you can have multiple tracks here and you'd have that for like stereo, but this is just a mono fader. This is referred to as a potentiometer or a fader depending on who you ask. Um, I call them, if they're lengthwise, if they're linear, I call them faders. It's a linear potentiometer, but I call them faders. So what happens is, if this is way at the bottom, This would be our audio signal in, and this is our out. So our in is fed all the way down this thing, and there's no resistance on this side here. But this side has more and more and more and more resistance as we get further down, because we're actually taking electricity out way at this end. So the electricity comes in here, goes through the little jumper, and then has to travel through all of this carbon before it goes out the wire on the end. And all of this carbon slows down the electrons and it, it turns that energy into heat so it creates a resistance, a lot of resistance. And as we move the little carriage up to this end, if we go all the way to the top, well now it can come right in here, jump through my little wiper, and then go through just a little tiny bit of the carbon before it goes out. So there's almost no resistance, so the sound would be really, really loud. And the further we go down, the more of this carbon it has to go through. So it just gets quieter and quieter and quieter as we go. So here, we'll put this on facing the right way. So that'd be loud sounds. And we go down, 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 down. It gets quieter and quieter and quieter. And all the way down to here. And it's possible to very accurately compute the amount of electrical resistance by where you are. So they can, they can pretty accurately know what's going on, like how loud they can expect this to be based on other stuff in the circuit. And you can compensate for that because you're never gonna get these all perfect. So you dial it in 
with our top knob. If you remember, we had that attenuation knob on top, or gain as it's called on most consoles. And that's how you compensate for this, because they're all a little bit fuzzy. You can do it with a pretty high degree of accuracy, but they're never going to be spot on. Especially not something at this price point. You're not going to be using high precision logarithmic faders. So that's how they do it. They, you, you have enough little things that you can adjust and you can make the whole thing usable. It's good enough. You're not doing rocket science with this. These faders come in other types. Um, this is a standard linear fader. Logarithmic faders have a pattern of things printed on here, the resistance traces, and they come in in different ways and it's all balanced out and there's a lot of engineering that goes into that and they're really cool to see. And if somebody ever sends one in, I'd be really happy to autopsy it for you guys because they're pretty nifty. But it works on the same principle. You've got your resistance track here and your conductive track here, and it's just the values of those together. And that's how you figure out what your resistance is. So everything in this whole thing boils down to this knob. This is, this is the mixing console. 99% of the time when you're the guy running the console, you're moving the faders. And if you're not moving faders, you're moving the other pots, and those are the same thing as this except in a circle. If we open up one of these, here, we can do that real quick. We'll cut one right off the board. Now, there's a lot of potentiometers on this thing, but I'm just going to grab the first one closest to me because they're all going to be pretty much the same. The values are a little different. They change around a little bit. But look, we've, we've got a metal can. We've got our plastic little trolley, and then we've got a circuit board, and we've got the little fingers that wrap over. It's just like the other one. See, you've, you've never seen inside one of these before, and now already look at how familiar the parts are because it's, it's very similar to the other one. So we pop these off. This is so cool. Never gotten to do rotary pots or linear pots on an autopsy before. Okay, so we'll take this right off and we'll just pop the whole thing apart. Now look, we've got our goop, that's our, our Vaseline, which gives us the resistance that we want. That makes it feel right. And that's just our housing, it's our backing. And, and just like in this one, there's, there's the contact surface. So we open this up and we'll just slide, the. it should pop right out. There. So now we've got little seal, little gasket thing. And see that, the springy metal bits? That's our wipers, and here they're on what appears to be a little piece of brass. And then here's our housing. And then the wipers ride against that piece there. They actually ride against two different things because we've got the black thing there is our carbon track, that's our resistor. And then there's another piece here this, it wasn't a gasket, this is actually our center wiper. So this sits like that. And now on our linear fader, we had the metal wiper and the carbon track. Okay, so there's our metal wiper and the black one's the carbon track. Here, this is our metal wiper, the center metal wiper. And that's our carbon track. And you can get these with different resistances in the carbon track. Like you can get these where it's a 1K resistance across or a 5K or a 10K. And that's just by changing the formula of the, copper, or the carbon. But this part goes through there, and I don't know how well you'll be able to see this. But you can see that the little fingers rub against the track. They ride against the track, and that's where you get your electrical conductivity. So this works the same way. Like you're familiar with a volume knob where when you, know, you turn it this way and it's quiet, you turn it that way and it goes up all the way to 11. But this is what's actually happening inside. It's actually working backwards. When you turn it down, our little fingers go all the way over to this side, and you're, you're pulling the output from here all the way through the thing to here. As you turn the volume up, the little finger moves around this way, and you get less and less and less of that carbon, because the more carbon you have, the lower the signal, the more it's resistive. So you're using less and less and less to where it's just touching, and at which point you pretty much just have a straight wire because you're going right from the input through the thing to the output. So the electrical connection on here isn't from this end to this end. The electrical connection would be from the high side where you want the loudest sound, so that direction, to the center pin. The center pin's your input. Now, here's where it gets cool. Some of the pots on here were labeled uh, pan, the balance knobs, right? 
same thing. Use the exact same pot because you've got your outputs on either end and your input goes in the middle. So if you wanted to use this as a balance pot, you use your right channel here and your left channel output here and then you feed in the center and when the wiper goes all the way to this side, you're feeding all to the right. When the wiper's in the middle, you're feeding straight, you know, straight center channel. When you're feeding to the left side, it's all to the left. And exactly where you put the knob is what ear you're going to hear it in. Now, the other side of the signal is the ground channel, but that's just a ground back. This is all hot side, so you have your positive connector from your microphone that would come in here, and then this goes to the right bus and this goes to the left bus or the, the stereo side. And then ground is ground is ground and, and it's easy. So that's how it works. You can use the same pot for a volume knob or for a balance knob and you can use the exact same part. You don't have to do anything special. It's really easy to do. And I'm, I'm covered in goop. So there's nothing left. That's our mixing console. We got to explore pots. We got to explore all kinds of circuitry and stuff. We got to check out this and get a quick look at, at this and the basics there. There's going to be more on this in another video. That's going to be fun. I want to hook that up and actually put sound through it and just blow your mind. It's great. So that's it. That's the autopsy of our big old 12-channel PV mixing console. And I want to thank you guys for sending that in. That was actually sent in viewer mail. And you'll get to see his super secret name at the end of the video here. He'll show up in the credits. But yeah, this is how it happens. If you have interesting things that you want to see me do an equipment autopsy on, send them in. We'll check it out. We'll take it apart. It'll be a fun time. So I'm Chris Bowden. You've been hanging out at the Geek Group where we've been taking things apart and learning about science, technology, and engineering. And as always, we'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.